Hello, everybody. Welcome to TSAM Digital. My name is Anum Khan. I'm the head of content here at Fox on Media. And joined by me today, I have Pat Riley. Pat is the director of America's Analytics at FactSet. Hello, Pat. How are you? Very good, Anum. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure to have you. Perfect, Pat. Um, just to kick things off, it would be brilliant if you could give us a brief introduction about yourself and let our audience know a little bit about FactSet. Yeah, of course. So my name is Pat Riley. I'm the director of the America's Analytics team. So that's a really broad remit, right? That goes from single security analytics and multiple asset classes. So equities, fixed income, uh, OTC derivatives, private markets, and then rolling up to portfolio, composite, and firm analytics. So we're, we're thinking there around things like performance and attribution, um, risk management, uh, valuation measures, you know, really everything that is the, the lifeblood of the asset management industry. Uh, you know, FactSet is a global market data provider, as well as an analytics solutions provider, um, a little over 40 years old, based in Norwalk, Connecticut, with uh, over 65 offices globally. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Pat. Um, to kick things off, my first question is, we see a rise in interest in the topic around data governance. Is this any different from data management? The short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is, you know, we've seen that rise his historically too. And whether that's a function of the evolution of our product suite or really uh, the results of a new normal where you're seeing larger and more complicated organizations operating in more and more locations globally, uh, then dealing with different client demands, uh, different investor tastes and different regulatory requirements. Uh, you know, I'd actually, when I think about data governance, I think about five key pillars uh, or five activity sets. You know, I think about sourcing, I think about integration, uh, quality assurance. There's a level of analysis that's actually going into that, you know, and I think that parallels the asset management analysis space. And then you have distribution, right? So if we think about those as kind of the, the five main sets under the, the governance umbrella, ultimately, it's a lot more than, than data management, right? Uh, where I start seeing things, if, it, if we look at only sourcing as an example, right? Historically, uh, you're looking at market data. So prices, fundamentals, uh, maybe some level of single securities, right? Or, or security master data. But then you also need to start thinking about where the industry is going. So ESG is, is probably the easiest kind of hot button topic. There's so many providers, uh, coverage is uh, really all over the place, both based on asset class and provider chosen. Um, you start thinking about other alternative data sets. So things like sentiment data or supply chain or um, geolocation or web. Uh, you know, th there's just so much more data that is trying to work its way into the investment process, right? understanding where you're sourcing from and how that ties into your current operating environment is really foundational to everything else that you see. Uh, when I start to think then about integration and quality assurance, you know, there, it's not just understanding, okay, is the data we have in the system, the system, because there's never just one system, right? Uh, is the data that we have internally in a data lake or a, a data warehouse, whatever that data layer may be, is that accessible across all of our requirements? Um, how is that accessible? And is that consistent, right? So there are real operational and business risks to, to getting data governance right in terms of that sourcing uh, access and ultimately downstream distribution. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. And and Pat, what are some of the benefits of having a good data governance uh, process? And, and why should I care? I think there are a number of benefits. You know, ultimately, first, uh, it's faster time to market. And time to market, in this case, could be new product launch. Um, I'm thinking here about um, concept of semi-transparent ETFs. That's something that comes to mind for me really easily. Uh, the other aspect that comes to mind for me is enhanced client service. Right. You know, certainly when you're meeting with clients, whether that's in the industry or it's downstream clients, you want the answer to generally be yes. Uh, and so how do you how do you actually ensure that you can satisfy that client need? 
I think the other benefit is uh, a checks and balance system in place, right? Certainly firms operate with uh, multiple levels of compliance and monitoring, uh, whether that's in data management or standalone, uh, standalone teams. But to me, you really want a check and balance or checks and balances between those types of groups. And so a robust data management process or data governance process really kind of creates that organically um, just because of the data flow and the linkages that occur naturally across data elements and uh, corresponding teams. Mm -hmm. And Pat, now that more organizations are moving to a cloud-based strategy for their data management processes, how does data governance come into play? Um, and what happens if their data is no longer stored in one, one place? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's really going to be uh, an ongoing story for the next several years, right? Certainly, you still see a demand for um, on-prem or on-premises but the vast majority of, of my client base, at least, is looking at cloud first or cloud only. Uh, I think there are a couple of aspects to consider there. Uh, first is, is migration of your current architecture. So can it really be a lift and shift? More importantly, should it be? You know, from my opinion, I would use a cloud migration as an opportunity to uh, try to reduce inefficiencies that currently exist revisit legacy processes, right? If you're looking at, at uh, kind of a, a legacy uh, investment process, and I frame this from a, a fact set perspective, it's not uncommon to kind of set it and forget it. And you know, the technology changes, personnel changes, uh, the underlying data itself changes, you know? So there, there's a lot of technical debt that you build up that you may not even be aware of and so using a cloud migration as an opportunity to, uh, to winnow that down, I, I think is imperative. Uh, I think the second piece that comes to mind for me is, is new data. And new data in this case, right, it could be specific data sets, which, which we'd hit on in terms of you know, the ESGs or the alt data space. But look at the consolidation you're seeing in the industry, right? Whether that's institutional asset management, whether that is um, expansion of localized pension plans, Right? We, and we, we see that in different regimes globally. You also see a huge amount of consolidation in the wealth management space. Uh, so the concept of new data, I think, is uh, really a standalone in a cloud migration component. And really what you want to think about there is uh, completeness more than anything else. You know, your, your process versus a legacy, uh, legacy migration doesn't necessarily change the difference is you have a lot more to explore to understand either where the, the weak links or the inefficiencies might lie. Perfect. And when we talk about data management and data governance, we cannot forget about the technology that goes with it. Um, what should investment professionals um, look for in technology when they're looking to invest in these sort of tools for their data governance processes? Yeah, in, in my opinion, you're really looking for a, a belts and braces approach, right? What, what we do at Facts that uh, I would separate market data from portfolio data first and foremost. With market data, so things like prices, uh, investment fundamentals, uh, corporate actions, right? There's there really is more of a an opportunity to automate, and you can definitely use technology to identify exception based returns or exception based uh, errors that would warrant more manual intervention. Uh, but I think, you know, if you're starting with symbology and concordance, use that as your baseline and build up from there. That really addresses kind of your core market data piece. On the portfolio data side, to me, it really becomes about uh, answering the five W's. You know, what, what are we integrating? Are these single portfolios? And how do you define a portfolio? Is it a single asset? Is it equities? Is it fixed income? Is it mutual funds or SMAs? You know, and as, as a security line item, uh, those types of asset classes look really, really similar in a raw data file. But in terms of what you're trying to do with that data via any platform, the use cases vary really, really wildly. Uh, so, you know, what are we integrating? Uh, where are we sourcing it from? Is it custodial? Is it an accounting feed? 
Is it a data lake? Uh, what types of transformations need to occur, right? And can those be reduced, altered, or shifted somewhere else in the process? Um, I think it's always important to ask why. Uh, and that just, I think it, it lends itself to the concept of certainly, I think today's mindset is more data is always better, um, but is it, right? So you know, do, do we need these thousand columns for a, a given portfolio? Maybe, but maybe not, right? And so, you know, thinking about today and the future state, being able to try to find some, uh, some ways to, to smooth that, that total data set and, and winnow that down, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. And we're finally approaching to our last question. Is data governance a concern of large multinational organizations or should smaller organizations be concerned as well? Oh, I think all organizations should be concerned. You know, I think, uh, I think the point of view of concern changes slightly depending on the organization, right? Where, and I wouldn't make it about the level of AUM, I would make it about the role in the investment process. Mm -hmm. If I'm thinking about the institutional asset manager, uh, certainly firms of all shapes and sizes need to be concerned about this. And it, because it's not just a, a reputational component, it's not just business risk or regulatory compliance, you know, it, it's, it's all of those things. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, you're in the business to generate flows and um, satisfy clients, right? And hopefully outperform. You know, that's always the, that's always the nice to have. Uh, from the, maybe the asset owner side of the business, you still have regulatory implications that are, are very different than an institutional asset manager is going to face, and oftentimes much more restrictive. Uh, you have a, a potential difference, difference in benchmarking, right? Your institutional asset managers might be thinking about solely total return, but if you're an insurance company or a pension scheme, you have a liability target to meet, right? So making sure that you're, you're compiling those pieces just to keep the lights on uh, and not go into administration is really critical. Um, and then if I think about you know, wealth or moving into the retail space, similar, you, you have the regulatory components, right? If, if anything, that's gonna be the common theme across all three, uh, but there's the brand component and the, and the brand risk that, that I think stands out to me at, at that wealth and retail level. All right. Thank you very much, Pat, for this really interesting discussion. Hopefully our audience have enjoyed it as well. And hopefully they're able to join us at the tech show to hear more around data governance from you guys. Great. Thank you very much.